So cognitive biases result. Cognitive biases are obviously thinking in a skewed manner. A bias is just a skew, right? It means that you tend to do this, but you're not entirely fair about it. It's cognitive, it's a way of thinking, but cognition is tied into behavior, right? Cognition is tied into motion. How you think about something matters in terms of how you'll behave in response to it or how you'll feel about it. So one of the biggest cognitive biases is called the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error. That's interesting because fundamental suggests it's at the core of people, and it is. Attribution is your idea of how you attribute cause to an actor. An actor not being a person on stage, uh, but a person. So somebody doing something, somebody acting in some way. When you see a behavior, what do you attribute that behavior to? Do you attribute that behavior to them as a person because it's characteristic of them, it's a trait of them, or do you attribute that behavior to a situational influence? Well, by and large, we don't attribute people's behavior to situational influences. We attribute their behavior to them, almost always, and almost without question. And that's interesting because that's where we get the error. <laughs> Because there are so many situational factors that are intangible and hard to take into account that are influencing our behavior at any given time that we just don't even take them into account when making our judgment. We'll rule them out. For example, if you've got somebody playing uh, outfield and you're a fan of, of the opposing team and they miss a fly ball, you're going to jeer and say, man, I can't play, ain't no good. Now the person who actually dropped the ball is going to say, well, the, the sun was in my eye. Right? I, was, I looked up and I couldn't see the ball. They have a situational explanation for the behavior of missing the ball, but the rest of the people in the stadium, probably even the people on his team, are going to say, God, bumbled it. Bad play. Are you a bad player? That would explain that behavior. But a more common example from my point of view is driving in a car. So you drive in a car and somebody cuts you off. And what do you say? You go, wow, I wonder what the situational factors were that influenced them to cut me off. Or you just go, asshole, just like that judgment was final and accurate. You say, jerk, you're such a jerk. You don't care about me or my safety. You're an aggressive person. You start labeling them and you attribute the behavior of, being, of them cutting you off to something stable a trait characteristic within that person whom you do not know. If you don't know them, you can put all kinds of labels on them. You can judge them in all kinds of negative ways and you'll never be challenged. Thus, you'll never find out if it was wrong or right. But flip that around a minute. You ever cut somebody off? I bet you've cut somebody off before. And when you cut them off, did you look at yourself in the mirror and go, you asshole, you are such a jerk, you don't care about anybody's safety. Did you throw the same labels at yourself? My guess is you didn't. My guess is that you went, ah, oh, that was a stupid error, I'm sorry. You might have even thrown up your hand, but you might not have because you didn't want them to think you were flipping them off. You want them to know it was a mistake, that you didn't mean it, that you're not that kind of person. In other words, the situation, either I was distracted by a conversation I might have been having with somebody in the car, I was looking down at my radio, or maybe you were doing something you really shouldn't have been done, distracted by texting, etc. cetera. Um, whatever it is, you know, just caught up in, in thought. And I drifted over into this lane without checking or didn't check my blind spot. You have all these situational explanations for why you cut somebody off. But if somebody cuts you off, it's automatically the kind of person they are that accounts for it. Research shows it only takes the average person three seconds to realize the person they just flipped off behind them is their boss. I'm nah, just kidding. Uh, so, fundamental attribution error. We go to the trait explanation almost by default every time. So we have an actor-observer effect. Because we attribute other people's behavior to dispositional causes, and we have our own behavior explained oftentimes by situational causes, we have this discrepancy. And we're not willing to give other people the charity, right? The, the benefit of the doubt that we would give ourselves. Uh, if, the, if the cause was situational, we want people to know that and take it into account so they don't misjudge us, but that doesn't mean they're gonna. Because of the fundamental attribution error, they're gonna assume that, yeah, that's excuse making. You're just making excuses. Unless it happened to them, in which case they'll say the same thing. 
And now you might think they're excuse making, but it's a fascinating process that is very reliable. And then we have this self-serving bias. When we look at ourselves, we tend to interpret our own history, our own behavior, our own existence in a much more positive self-serving light than might be objectively warranted. Because we make attributions that are very forgiving for ourselves. Uh, if we have a mistake, we will find lots of reasons why we made the mistake that aren't core to us, dispositional. But if something goes right, we want credit for that. Damn, I'm good. I do good work, whatever it is. I want credit for things that went right, and I will dismiss criticism for things that went bad because I'll just say, well, they don't realize what really was going on. If I didn't have this boss or this deadline or this work team or this whatever, 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 I would, of course it would have gone right for me. You'd have a situational explanation, and that keeps you from, from dinging yourself, from, from looking down on yourself, which is actually predictive of good mental health. In the extreme, it's narcissism, but in a mild form, because you see yourself in a more positive way than might be objectively warranted, you're more optimistic. You're more likely to persevere through barriers and, and obstacles, and it can be adaptive to have a mild form of this. But being aware of it simply helps you understand yourself better and helps you understand other people better. Why do people sometimes seem like they don't take responsibility? Probably because they don't see themselves as responsible as you see them. They see themselves differently. That's part of this whole social cognition thing. And then, I've talked about this before, you have the self-fulfilling prophecy. By making a judgment about people, you form in your mind this schema about them. And then all the evidence is going to fit into that schema. You're not going to see them objectively anymore. Once you've made your judgment, you will treat them in ways that are consistent with that judgment and you're very likely to bring about behavior that seems consistent with the judgment, thus confirming that you are right, giving you false pride and false confidence in your judgment. Labeling people has a powerful effect and you want to be very careful about this because it happens so subtly. People are so confident that they made the right decision. You look on Facebook if you want a little bit of judgment. It don't take long to see people firing off and they've got full you know, judgments rendered on people they've never met before when they have just scraps of information about the situation that we're considering. I'll give you a real situation. I was in a local elementary school where my kid was going to school and they had a teacher appreciation break. That morning they were going to have a breakfast with the teachers and they asked parents to come in and look after the classroom. Now you know what do we know about memory? I think it was a first grade classroom. Might have been kindergarten or I don't think it was kindergarten. I think it was a first grade classroom. Could have been second grade. Anyway, I walk into this classroom as a teacher uh, you know, was walking out. I'm the volunteer that's going to look after the class. And the teacher says, thank you for coming today. Seems like a nice person. And then she says, now before I go, I want to look out for that one. Because he's a liar. And she says this in front of all this class. All these little kids are looking over. And there's this child sitting by her desk in a, in a little desk that's attached to her desk while all the other kids sit everywhere else. And she says that in front of everybody. Watch this one, he's a liar. And then she says, he just got back from suspension if that tells you anything about him. I said, okay. It does tell me something about the situation. It tells me a lot more about the teacher than it does about this first grader. What the hell do you gotta do to get suspended in first grade? This woman had a very negative opinion about this guy. And she says, he's got homework to do. All these other kids can watch TV. They had a movie they were gonna have. They can have snacks and watch the movie. He's got to do his work, but he'll never finish it. I said, okay, thanks. Just neutral. She walked on. I then go over to the guy who looks up to me, this little one, uh, her first grade kid, and he looks up at me sheepishly. He's Hispanic, which is interesting, and he's in a predominantly white room, right? I don't make any judgment about that. It's just a noted difference in skin tone but possibly a difference in culture, probably a difference in how he's treated, and maybe a difference in whether he has access to uh, resources at home that would help him with homework and stuff. If his family, for instance, didn't speak English well, then if he was sent home with homework, it would be hard for them to help him with that homework. Anyway, it's math homework. There's these little inchworms and stuff. It's got underneath them a little ruler, ticks on it that says, you know, one, one and a quarter, one and a half, two, whatever. And he looks up at me. I said, well, what do you think it is? I don't, I don't give this kid any smiles or anything. I said, what do you think it is? He's like, three? I said, write it down. He writes three. 
and he does the next one, and he does the next one. And the other kids are doing the thing, they're now watching the movie. He looks up at me, and I'm, he's like, well, what do you think it is? He's like, one and a half. I said, is it closer to one and three quarters or one and a half? He's like, one and three quarters? Write it down. That's it. I did that about three or four times. This kid finished all of his work like that. Just a little bit of neutral encouragement where I didn't take her labeling of him to be a justified label. I took it to be a highly biased label based on some conclusions she had drawn about the kid. She was trying to warn me so that I would make these conclusions about the kid before I ever knew the kid. But I just watched him do all of this homework in 10 minutes that she said he'd never finish all day. After that, it was snack time. And he said, can I pass out the snacks? I said, go ahead. Again, I'm not going, oh, you did a good job. I'm not giving him lots of positive feedback. I just said, go ahead. He got up with a tray full of snacks and went around pretty as you please to every single kid. And each kid pulled a snack off the tray. And then he went back to his own little desk attached to the teacher's desk and he got his snack. And interestingly, he spilled his drink. And he looked at me like he thought I was going to beat him to death. He looked frightened when he spilled that drink. I just looked at him and went, shrugged my shoulders. And he smiled and he got up and got paper towels and he cleaned it up himself. He didn't get in trouble. He just fixed the problem. After it was all over, time to get all the trash up. He said, can I collect trash? I said, absolutely, go ahead. He went around again, every person, and got all this trash. Now that don't look like a devil kid to me. That looks like a kid willing to do some really cool and pro-social things and get his homework done, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think I told that to the teacher? Absolutely not. Because she already concluded he's a little liar going to be expelled again probably, and that anything that I said in the positive, she would think I would be naive and that he played me and manipulated me into thinking something that certainly wasn't true. But can imagine, if she's already drawn these conclusions, how she treats this child in class. And the things that you would do if you were thought to be a liar, if you were told in front of everybody you were a liar, that you were no good, that you weren't able. This kid's going down a bad road because this woman is going to tell the next teacher that he gets in the next grade up, watch out for this one. He's a liar. He's a bad one. And by having that already in their mind, they will then treat the child differently. The child will act differently and they will confirm their suspicions. Anything he does good is going to be considered to be manipulative and ingenuine. Anything neutral he does will be considered negative. Anything negative he does is going to be evidence that you were right to begin with. That's fascinating because there have been a lot of studies that show when you randomly manipulate teachers' impressions of children as being smart kids or not so smart kids, they actually get differences in grades and socialization based on that. That's the self-fulfilling prophecy. It happens at your work. happens at your church. It happens in your schools. It happens because human beings do it.